Welcome to Steve Allen's Comedy Room. Where funny people gather just for laughs. Visiting us today, comedy monologist Shelley Berman. Comedy star and actor Red Button. Lonesome George Goble. New young comedian Glenn Hurst. The Terry Gibb Sextet. And now, your host, Steve Allen. You know, sometimes people who notice that I work in a sort of a naturalistic style wonder, am I really ad-libbing or am I just reading cue cards? The young lady here with the red thing, would you hand me the, just the first card, please? We'll share a little, uh, just come right in. Thank you very much. This is what it says on the first card. Good. So, uh, I'll take care of that. No. What do you want me to talk about? <laughs> Now, we have four wonderfully funny people. I don't know what with all the screaming and mayhem. The screaming, I can understand. The mayhem, I could do without. Anyway, whether you actually heard that we have Shelley Berman and George Goble and Red Buttons and Red, uh, Glenn Hirsch with us. So, uh, more very funny, gentlemen. And the man doing all the screaming and the mayhem was our English sidekick, all the way from London, the very funny Joe Baker, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Nice lovely. to have you. Don't we have some wonderful guests today? Oh, they're marvellous. Terrific. Um, do, do, do you think there's any chance of me telling a joke? Well, we're a little late already, Joe, with the card thing and everything. But it's quick, well, one, quick I guess one. Be all right. If it's a quick one, go ahead. Yeah, okay. The, the, this, this Polish man... Oh, oh, wait, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's in the worst possible taste. That went out years ago, and not on any show of mine will anyone do a Polish joke, because Polish people would be offended. Oh, well, we don't tell them like that in England. They're, we tell Irish jokes. So this, um... Wait, hold it just one moment. I'm just for the heck of it. I'm going to let you tell the joke because I can't wait to see what it is. But before you do, I want you to know one thing. I am Irish. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll speak slower. <laughs> All right, now i got to hear the joke. Well, you know that Polish jokes and Irish are the same. So let's To be it. England. Right. Yeah, right. So, um... This, um, this, this, this Irishman from Warsaw... Wait a moment now. ...went into a restaurant... <laughs> ...went into a restaurant, he ordered a meal, paid for it, and then he sneaked out without eating it. <laughs> <laughs> you saw me standing alone. So, uh... You see why I... <laughs> we don't do that sort of thing here. No, obviously. Very poor I might as well introduce the guest. Would you agree? Yes, would I'll... You, would you concur? Um, would you concur? Not in front of all these all people. All right, fine. No, <laughs> my, first, my first guest is a fellow who worked with us originally on the old Tonight Show and then on the Sunday Show. And he uh, was, in that generation, considered one of the new young comedians, as Glenn, I was a new young comedian then myself, come to think of it, weren't we all? But uh, he was always uh, funny in a very original way, and still is. Nobody else ever did funniness exactly the way this gentleman did and still does. Welcome, Mr. Shelley Berman. Oh. Shelley, make yourself comfortable. We'll be right over. <laughs> the next fellow has been a dear personal friend for a good many years. He, too, has run the gamut. Is, was that him running the gamut out there? What? I, I heard a gamut running, and they must have turned it off in the meantime. Anyway, he has had his own comedy series. He's been in the movies. He has won an Academy Award, and that's more than some people I could mention. <laughs> be that as it may, he's a, a, an actor, quite seriously, as well as a funny man. And he and Dick Clark share the secret of youth, apparently, because I happen to know that Red Buttons is actually 104 years old. 
<laughs> but I'm saying he has the face of an 18-year-old. And he better give it back. He's getting it all wrinkled. But anyway, there's... No, serious. No kidding. He doesn't have a wrinkle on him. And I've checked every inch of his body because it's a weird kind of... A... Anyway, here he is. The fountain of youth himself, Mr. Red Button. <laughs> hey. we'll, we'll be right over, Rich. The next gentleman, I knew his work before I knew even you guys. And you guys have been in the business for many years. Back in Chicago in the mid-1930s, I was, I don't know, whatever the heck I was, 11 years old or something. And uh, one of the most popular shows in the Midwest for many years, in fact, all over the country, was the WLS Barn Dance. Remember that, you <laughs> Midwesterners? And... This was long before you were in this country, Joe. Uh, one of the prime attractions on the old barn dance show, a musical comedy variety hour, was a little cute country boy called, seriously, <laughs> Little Georgie Goebel. He played the guitar and he sang with a high, clear nasal twang. And lo and behold, not terribly many years later, there was a famous comedian, turned out to be the same guy, still very funny, Mr. George Goebel. Yes. Yay! Nice to have you with us, guys. You know, what's interesting. This is the third show of this series that we have done. That means we've had about, I don't know, ten comedians, all starkers, all very funny people. And it's only at this point that it occurs to me that no two of them have been funny, have done funniness in the same way. Each guy has his individual style, and you three certainly have. Well, George, how old were you when you first found out you were funny? Sir? Well, I, uh, I found out when I was in school, uh, when I was very young. I was born very young. <laughs> so I, I did get off to a kind of a slow start. But as I grew up, which I didn't do, I mean, I quit growing before. And as a result, when I went to school, like at, uh, in a gym class, when they line up according to size, I'd go way down the other end, and the teacher would say something about, uh, what are you doing down there? I said, I'm going to end up at the end anyway. Why don't I just go down there? That was a big one in uh, Cleveland High School, uh, Cleveland Grammar School. Might I ask your height, either that or how tall you are? Doesn't well, uh, <laughs> well, which would you like first? Uh, how tall you are? Oh, how tall I am. Well, when people ask me how tall I am, I say uh, five foot five. But actually, as Hal Cantor once pointed out, I'm five foot four and three quarters, which means I'm always just about a quarter of an inch away from the truth. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, Red and Shelley, again, in talking with the earlier comics, Sid Caesar and, and, and Shecky and Dick Shaw and a lot of the other guys, uh, putting the same general question to them, when did you first begin to become aware that you were funnier than the other kids in your class or the other people in your neighborhood or family? And when did you begin to use that in a conscious sense? It turned out that a lot of them did it as a kind of a socially, seriously, defensive thing. They lived next to a tough neighborhood or they were the shortest guy on the block. They got beaten up a lot, and this, I'm also in the same category. We discovered, many of us, that if you could make the bullies laugh, they wouldn't hit you. Did any of you find this when you were kids? No, they kept hitting me. They kept hitting you anyway. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was one of the things that made them hit me, I think, my <laughs> being funny. <part. laughs> they resented it, right? I'd you know, go out and look for tough guys on 18th Street, yeah. and, uh, and I'd say, hey, want to hear something? How? Oh, right. <laughs> Never made it. Now, Red, you, I, I, you I are different. I had a different problem. I was the bully. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't see where I came from at all. No. I was beating kids no. up, whacking them on the head, yes. kicking them all over the place. You did come from a tough neighborhood, didn't you? Know, you? Nothing. And while I was doing it, I was laughing. I laughed a lot. Oh, a lot of laughing. It's a lot of poison. Oh, yes. <laughs> but kids kept yelling at me, hey, don't be funny, don't be funny, don't be funny. I think that was it. And That's it worked, it, it worked. It worked. <laughs> oh. That was a cheap shot. In that great... Oh, that, that was a cheap shot. I did six minutes and he came in and he oh, whacked no. it up. Well, that, it's called a zest. <laughs> That's what comedians do. It might be interesting to see how you guys, or to hear how you guys perceive each other 
in your capacities as funny people. I mean, you're already a hit. The jury voted years ago. You're all very funny. But what do you think, George, if anything, analytical, about, say, Shelley's humor? Could you be funny the way he is? Don't no, I, uh, I could not be funny. Uh, Red and I talked about this, some of the things that are going on nowadays. I couldn't do things like that. I mean, I couldn't use the... Not that Shelley does that kind of thing, but I couldn't do the things with the modern comics. Yeah, I know all the words. I've been in, in locker rooms. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't know what they mean. I, I know what they mean. <laughs> but I don't, I, don't, I don't, I can't say them. You know, I've done them. I've done them. Yeah. Done. All right, since the subject has sprung up out of the conversation, again, be as silly as you want, but I'd like to get to the truth beneath the silliness. Uh, I discovered that not only most human beings over, say, 45 really are strongly critical of the degree of filth that you find in modern comedy. But even most professional comedians over 50, let's say, are very outspoken about this. Speak out. How do you feel about it? Well, that? I'm going to ask somebody over 50 one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know several of them. No, but I, I think that a lot of them feel that way. But with me, it's not that I resent it. Like I say, I know all the words and a lot of the things are funny, yes, yes. but it doesn't fit and I can't talk about it because it might be sour grapes. Somebody offered me two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a week or something like that to say you some of those. Say of I'd, I'd say I got four of them all lined up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for somebody to come. Out. <laughs> the, the, the point here is not an either or, all white or all black situation. I I don't think I've ever known a comedian who didn't do a little naughty stuff at certain times. Literally, I can't think of any. Even Will Rogers once or twice I heard. Oh well, yeah, we lost our subtleties. We don't have them anymore. Yeah. We, uh, uh, there was a time, I guess, in America where it seemed to get, uh, uh, we got uh, more overtly rebellious. I think it had to do with the Vietnam War and with the, where the Supreme Court saying that blacks uh, are equal and the blacks kept saying, okay, when? And, and uh, <laughs> you know, we're equal, but, you know, how long will it be before it's decided? Yeah. And, and, uh, and then we were in this war that was not a popular war, and we had some kids on campuses rebelling and people yeah. started screaming, and music got louder, mm -hmm. and... Poetry got raunchier, mm -hmm. and comedy got extremely hostile. Yeah. And you can't, you can't really be entirely subtle when you're being hostile, because mm -hmm. you're, you're socking. Yeah. So comedians that were standing around on the wings, and there were very good comedians, Don Rickles suddenly became a star. He From, was there. He was ready with the hostility. He was there. Yeah. He was there. Uh, Buddy Hackett, who was a star at the time, but became a more important star. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that... Uh, uh, all this, Mar Godfrey Cambridge, nice, nice young man mm -hmm. who's dead now, he, he became a star. Because yeah. they were saying something needed to be said and they said it strongly. But we did, as a result, lose our subtleties. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you remember years ago when Clark Gable picked Vivian Lee up in his arms, walked up those steps and got to that door, and walked through that door, and it was dissolved, and the next morning there she was in bed with that big smile on her face. Yeah. <laughs> Today, they show it all to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I can't believe, I can't stand watching that stuff because basketball I'll watch, football I'll watch, but if it's a sport I can play, why should I be a spectator? <laughs> <laughs> I got hostile for a while there, too, but only towards spooky old Alice. That's the only one. Because <laughs> I can handle that all right, you know. There's a lot of wisdom, I think, in, in the old black song title that goes, it ain't what you do, it's the way how you do it. Uh, to return to the point that all comedians do a little off-color material at certain times, but most of the, the long-time professionals know when to do it and when not. If you're on at 1 o'clock in the morning in Las Vegas, the average person in your audience is 57 and is drunk, who cares much what you do? You know. But I have seen comedians who should know better go in front of audiences where they're little girls, you know, uh, nuns, whatever, people that you shouldn't do dirty jokes in front of, and they go ahead and do them anyway. That's dumb, I think. Little nuns. Little seven-year-old nuns, yeah. <laughs> Little cutie nuns. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Red? Well, can you do it in front of big nuns? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just... I couldn't do it in front of a penguin, to tell you the truth. I just... It's not my style of comedy. How do I feel about it? Well, sure. let me give you the analogy. Let me, let, let me get, uh, just uh, to extend what, uh, what Shelley just said. Mm -hmm. In burlesque years ago, the reason that the comedians started working dirty, we called it cack, you know, mm -hmm. when they were khaki, mm -hmm. is because the women started taking off more. See, the more the they took off, the more the comics had to walk out and get raunchier because you can't walk out and do little boy blue stuff yeah. when girls are out there going, the owl, and the curtain 
curtains are falling and things are happening and babies are being born on stage. And, you know, I mean, if it doesn't work, then you but can't it, walk out and do Hickory Dickory Dock, you but, know. Uh, you can do it the right way. <laughs> there is a right way, but I closed never the whole mind, Disney mind, Channel if I did No, seriously. The Mayor LaGuardia finally had to close it down. It got too dirty, in the opinion of most people. I was in the last show. No. I have the dubious distinction of being on stage. You're dubious. Really, when the place, when the place was raided. Really? I was on stage with Margie Hart uh -huh. doing a scene from Shakespeare's immortal drama called Who's Got Pockets? <laughs> the truth I'll never and I'll never forget I'll never forget the mad dash we made for the patrol wagon you know I, nobody likes to stand riding downtown you know yeah. <laughs> when when we got to the courtroom when we got to the courtroom the judge made us do the sketch we did when the joint was pinched literally and it, literally and to give you an idea of how dirty this sketch was when it was over the judge had the jury arrested for watching an obscene performance. Now, come on. <laughs> done that joke in 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> There's no way to get you guys to be serious. I don't know. Oh, that was serious? I was serious. <laughs> Let's talk about serious acting for the moment. My own <laughs> casual hypothesis is that as a class, granting exceptions and one sits right here, as a class, comedians are not terribly good, are not noted as being good at serious acting. Now, we can all act in a comedy movie, but not many professional comedians can do what Dustin Hoffman does for a living, what Al Pacino does for a living, what Marlon Brando does for a living. Some can't. Shelley, you played a serious role in, for example, The Best Man, that political movie. Mm -hmm. So here sits two. George, have you ever done a serious acting role? Well, not exactly serious, you know, but like... Uh... Play it again, Sam. I mean, where well, you had to act. I acted pretty good. I yeah. Thought. Well, again, comedy acting. You, uh, co comedians often have to act if they're in a situation comedy, because that's a little comedy drama. I it's always comedy. thought that George's comedy stuff was serious. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I learned a lot about the theater. You can learn about the theater doing comedy. Right. You too, you know, I, fight, I know, too. you know, like in the theater, if they work in nightclubs, and somebody says, "Hey, George, you turn around," and what? You use your neck, you know. Mm -hmm. If you're in the theater, you don't do that. How do you do you know, it? You're, because, but I know they they put it on a little bit. I know because I did. I changed the minute I became a thespian too. You know, I, I. Somebody says George, I say yes. <laughs> Very graceful. That's the way you do it, you know. And I, I used to wear wear a top coat without putting my arms in the sleeves. Like an Italian director. Yeah, yeah. That's, I did that too. I never figured out those actors why they did that. They. I guess so when they turn around, they don't knock the damn coat off or something. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. That could be. I learned a lot, you know. So you were a thespian, eh? I was for, oh, several, a year I was a thespian. <laughs> I have to keep my eye on you guys uh, every inch of the way. No, I know exactly I was, what he's I talking think, about. I think actors, I think co comedians have frequently given <laughs> more credit than they deserve. <laughs> Seriously. Well, come on now. Let's get serious. All right. I forgot what I was going to say, Steve. You start comedians are given more yes, credit I mean, than they deserve. Comedians are frequently given more credit than they deserve for playing a serious role. Yeah. It's true. And, and freak, I hear the opposite. I hear that uh, you have to be a great actor to be a comedian. I think it's a lot of nonsense. I it is not true. There are only a few. There are only a, I could name just a few. Mm -hmm. And whenever I've been asked to name them, I have named Jackie Gleason. He's a true actor. True. As, a, as an actor, I remember Jack Benny being a beautiful actor. I differ on that. Of All right. Talking about serious okay, actors. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay. And the other... We the sound other, like Ebert and Ding Dong, the guys that review the movies. <laughs> and the other one, and, I'm not, and I, I swear this is the truth, the other beautiful actor who's a comedian is Red Buttons. Yes, there he is. Well, he won an Academy Award. For those who are like 12 years old and might think we're kidding about everything, you won the Academy Award for the movie... Sayonara. Sayonara, right. It was a splendid role and he handled yeah. it just right. I'll tell you why... I'll tell you why I did not agree with you that Jack Benny was a great actor. He was a brilliant comedy actor. In fact, that's really what he was, because he was not a witty man, you know, as many we can mention. But he was the king of the comedy actors. His whole career was pretending to be something he was not. 
He pretended to be stingy, he was really generous. He pretended to be conceited, he was really a lovely, humble man. Everything he, you thought he was, he was pretty much the opposite, lovely person. But uh, again, I'm talking about serious acting, such as Red did in that picture, what Jackie Gleason can do. If you can remember, if you can remember, you probably were too young, but if you can remember to be or not to be, mm -hmm. then you will remember a fine, elegant acting performance of a man entirely convinced of his circumstance and working with all the good rules. He Hardly. was splendid. I'll have to review that in the press. I'll tell you who else was a wonderful, yeah. wonderful actor in the twilight of his career when he had a chance to do it. Hmm. Ed Wynn. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, beautiful. Right? He did. Oh, Ed Wynn. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. You know, action was so moving. It was so, so touching. There were two other men whose names uh, hardly ever come up when this subject is discussed, so I shall introduce their names. And you, when I tell you, you'll probably think, wait a minute, these men were real actors? Yes, they had a, a true naturalness so that even in movies where they were saying even emotionally blank lines like, hey, Jim, the car's here, or something that isn't either funny or serious, it's just speech, they were totally convincing. One was Robert Benchley. Oh. And his case was unusual because he was a journalist and an author. They, he got screams at, at writers' dinners and things, so they put him into show business, my favorite comedian. And the other was uh, America's favorite comedian of the century, Will Rogers. Next time you see an old yeah. Next time you see an old Will Rogers movie, watch his readings on the non-comic lines. He's as convincing as any bon one you've ever seen. Yeah, well, he did. He did do some very, very good work. But we're talking only about the men. You know, we can't forget Mae West. Oh yeah. Who was a, a fine comedian, a great actress. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that. Well, I did that for the few ladies in our audience. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You've introduced. You've introduced an interesting subject here. I went to see Mae West when I was doing my comedy series, The Old Red Button Show in 1898. You remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> and I, she was working at the Latin Quarter. I went back to see her. And Larry Gelbaugh was my head writer. He said, Red, if you can get Mae West, we'll write a thing As for a you. As a guest. As a guest. You yeah. know, we'll write a Lucretia Borgia with a thing. You're the shoeshine boy. You come yeah. in. So I went up to see her. Uh, they came in. Yes, yes. What is it? I said, Miss West, I'm Red Buttons. And... Uh, I was doing the show, and we, we've got a great idea for you and me. You play Lucretia Borgia, I play Shoeshine Boy. I come in, you try to poison me, but at the end, we wind up, and we're in love. And she just sat there, and she said to me, Sonny, you couldn't pass the physical. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> Not only a great comedian, but a great wit. Oh, yeah. And she wrote most of her own material, too, as yeah. I guess everyone knows. But let me jump to another area here. All of us, all five of us had at one time or another work clubs, and some of us occasionally still do. There's not that much action of that sort for anybody anymore. There is, of course, now the, the new type comedy clubs where all the, you know, 32-year-old comics work. But the traditional old-fashioned Chez Paris or, you know, La Martinique kind of nightclub, there are not very many of them left. Uh, but forgetting that factor... Has your own attitude about working nightclubs, you know, for drunks and hecklers, has that evolved? Most of the guys I've talked to say they don't like to do that anymore, even if the clubs are available. How about you, Red? Nobody heckles you in clubs anymore. I think the old days, there was much more heckling going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we walk out today, we walk out with a certain kind of respect. respect yeah. So people are not heckling. They come to see you, they're coming in to have a joyous evening with you. Mm -hmm. But the, the nightclubs today are all in the big gambling Joints. It's like working a theater. Vegas or the Atlantic audiences City. are great in Atlantic City in those and two in cities, Vegas and in those places. In those two cities, they are good. Sure, the old joints. It was, you know, where the boys had it and all that stuff. You oh, always get a guy in the back and the thing, you know, a little fight, a little thing that breaks out. But you couldn't control that. Yeah. I don't think there's, I, I don't find that kind of heckling going on anymore today. I don't think, well, with me, never was the heckling that bothered me. Although heckling would bother me. Because mm -hmm. I, when I was stuck, you know, my routines are built beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. To break out of them was very hard for me. Yeah. And at that time in my life, the routine was too precious to me. I didn't, I wasn't really a good comedian. I was very good at delivering routines. Hmm. So I didn't know how to handle them. But what really bothered me was that I couldn't do the small things, Steve. How I do you couldn't, mean? I couldn't do the delicate things like the little speck in a glass of milk, or I couldn't do uh, buttermilk. I couldn't do... But you did that the very early. Gen those gentle things occurred in concert, uh -huh. in theaters. The, the, the gentle comedy that I liked to do so much mm -hmm. wouldn't go because 
of just the, the ambience, which is just a, a little bit of noise, a little bit of movement, mm -hmm. a little bit of the audience being there, not necessarily to see you, but to woo a prospective <laughs> buyer or to buy a prospective friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> you, they, so you'd lose, just, I would lose just that much attention. Mm -hmm. So it always bothered me. Yeah. I don't work clubs today. I work concert. Mm -hmm. And I audiences the, are even nicer at concerts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In a theater, it's mother, marvelous. Sure. We have a, a piece of uh, old film or videotape now, uh, Shelley. It's one of your early routines. Uh, people are always asking comedians, uh, has comedy changed over the years? The answer is obviously simply because there is nothing in the universe that even can remain static. Everything changes. Only question is how much over how short a period of time or long. And in the old days, one of the easiest laughs, as you don't have to be told, was almost any reference to booze. With, you know, to this day, you say Dean Martin, 18 people start to giggle before you get to the joke. You know? <laughs> so that's always been true and still is. But it's not the big automatic laugh it was 30, 40 years ago. The biggest screams were during Prohibition. Then the worst drinking joke in the world got a scream. I discovered in being in a Broadway play in the 1950s, there was some drinking scenes. I never got such screams in my life and didn't deserve them that much. Sometimes I'd be in a club to a great joke, it would get a 42. On Broadway, any dumb little joke about booze would get a 96. Even if I was off that night, it would still get a 96. <laughs> but I think now, because of, sad to say, the drug scene over the last 20 years, just simple drinking jokes don't get the laughs any more that they used to. Do you, Red, think that? 96. 96. I never got that low. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever remember it my whole career. I was always up around 98 and a half, 99 and three quarters. Cut that in. <laughs> Shelley, one of your early big uh, successful routines was the hangover monologue. The morning after. The morning after, yeah. And do you still do that in your career? No, no, no. I, I, I may throw it in if, people, if there are enough people screaming, do it. Mm -hmm. But they sit there quietly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> we happen to uh, uh, we happen to have we're not going to ask Shelley to perform it but we happen to have that from I guess one of my old shows about 20, 25 years ago we have you doing that and, and uh, we're not going to run the whole thing because it ran about 8 or 9 minutes interesting thing in those days monologues could run 8, 9, 10 minutes today they want 4 minutes for the yeah, same kind of a thing that. so let's see what people were laughing at and it's quite understandable in the case of this particular comedian and this particular routine the hangover, the morning after routine, Shelley Berman from our old show about 25 uh, years ago. I can't <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Oh, boy. Uh, 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 hello there, uh, David, David boy. Hi, hi, how you doing there, David boy? It, it, it's me. It's your old buddy. It's me. It, it, it's, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, just a minute, Dave. Don't press me. It, it's, uh, uh, Dave, if you nag at me, I'll never get it. it <laughs> isn't that ridiculous? I just got a letter this morning. <laughs> Uh, do I sound familiar at all? Uh, want to take a stab at an am pen? I don't know what letter it begins with, uh, Dave. I mean, I know my own name. I know it as well as I know my own... Oh, uh, hang on, hang on a second. Let me see if I know the name. Real idiot. It's, uh, uh, it's Sam, Dave. That's what it is. Oh, Sam. How many Sams do you know? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, uh, Sammy Spiro, Dave. That's what it is, old Sammy Spiro. Well, let's not quibble about pronunciation, Dave. What is it, Spiro? All right, Spiro. <laughs> <laughs> Try to remember that short eye, Dave. Uh, how you feeling there, Dave? How you doing, fella? Oh, that, that, that's good. I, I'm glad to hear that. Not uh, so hot, Dave. I, I'm a little under the weather from last night's party. That's what I called you up to thank you for, that wonderful party you threw last night. Of course, we brought our own liquor, but you provided the electricity, and you can be <laughs> uh, Tell me, uh, Dave, did I have a good time? <laughs> no, I don't know, Dave. Well, at a certain point of the evening, everything's complete blank. <laughs> a few minutes after I got in. <laughs> what, what did I do? What? Oh, no. Oh, God. Oh, oof, boy. <laughs> the whole window, eh? <laughs> Come right out, huh? 
That, that, that's picture window, too, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lucky thing there was nobody walking under it at the time, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Boy, got a match, wise, huh? Oh, well, they'll, 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 put them, they'll put them back together, Dave. Those medical people are very... Dave, I can't imagine how I managed to break a window. I don't have any cuts or bruises on my hands. How to break the window? I see. Were you very fond of that cat? <laughs> that's, that's a portion. That's a portion of that classic routine. It goes on and on. Yeah. Now, did you hear these new screams in addition to the old laughs on that? I guess. I guess some of it. You were laughing. I, as a matter of fact, I found some of it funny. Yes. But we weren't laughing. We weren't laughing at the booze jokes. We were laughing at another at a man really in a terrible yeah. predicament. Trying to remember he what he did. Couldn't remember his name. Yeah. Right. George, you are credited with uh, a line that I must have heard forty people tell. Thank goodness they always do give you credit. And let's find out. Did you really say it? I bet you did. When was it, you were talking to Gary Moore or somebody about oh, the question yeah. as to whether some performers feel they need a little nip before they go on? What was the line? I said, uh, he was on our show. I used to be on his show a lot. As a matter of fact, that's where I met Red. And uh, I'd always have a little nip, just enough to steady myself. Mm -hmm. One time I got so steady I couldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then... Uh, You're laughing at drinking jokes again. Look at this. Yeah, I got some more of them, too, you know. But I learned that from my uncle. My uncle was a drinker. <laughs> he, my uncle, really, he, he, oh, my, he was a town drunk. Really? Yeah. And, and we lived in Chicago. <laughs> great joke. Yeah, great joke. Great joke. Uh, what do you mean those drinking jokes don't work? You're right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You went years ago, he said, uh, when you, you were on your way home, it was early in the morning, and I was just about to reach my house and some darn fool stepped on my fingers. Mm. Ah. <laughs> well, what was the line you were going to tell I asked us about? Gary, when he was on our show this one time, I said, you, would you like to stop in for a little nip? And he said, no, but I'll sure fire it up with you after the show, but I'm not going to have one before the show. I said, you mean you go out there all alone? Ah, <laughs> and, uh, that was it. <laughs> a little yeah. thinking there, yeah. you know, I'm not going to take that chance. If, <laughs> any, if any children are watching... Uh, Drinking is a very funny subject uh, considered in a comic context. In reality, it's not too funny. Anyway, so we've talked about drinking jokes and, and uh, the fact that drug jokes gradually replace them to a certain extent, but as we've seen, drinking jokes got screams. Red, we talked about Shelley Berman doing something. Uh, we saw the film of it from 25 years ago. You, uh, is, again, you don't have to be told, have what I think is maybe the single best routine that any comedian has ever devised for entertaining at big dinners, at benefit concert shows where there are maybe 14 famous oh. comedians and three famous singers. And that's why we usually put you on late because your routine is very strong. It's the never had a dinner bit, which we're not going to ask you to do now. But do any of your older routines come back to you, the ones you used to do 20, 30 years ago? I brought something along. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that the conversation took this turn. Uh -huh. I did this in the age of innocence, this mm -hmm. routine. I'll tell you how I found it. I was still in uniform. I had just gotten back from Europe mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. after the Spanish-American War. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting around the house in my, in my mother's house in the Bronx. And somehow or other, I got into my, one of my old H&M trunks. You know, we all had an old Herdick and Meisel trunk, and you the mentor a big shot from burlesque. And I found in that trunk my original autograph book from public school. High school. High public school. Oh. The little book that when you graduated, you went to your teachers or your classmates, and they wrote something in the book. I picked the book up. I read it. And I laughed out loud, and I found it very, very amusing. And I said to myself, yeah, I wonder if this could really be a piece of business. I'll never forget what I did. I went downtown. I used to hang out at Toots Shores at that time. I went in the Toots's, and all the guys were sitting around. I said, fellas, how about this? And the wise guys laughed. So I knew I had something. Mm -hmm. I haven't done this in about 25, 30 years. We'd love the it. The autograph book, I'd like to do just a touch for Please. For the folks. Anyway, Red Button for the autograph book.
I did the intro to this, so you know what I'm talking about. This is a little book that you went to your teachers and your classmates and you said, uh, mm, mm, could you sign? I, can the, mm. And here's what some of them wrote. Two buttons. <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue. God made me handsome. What happened to you? <laughs> Your friend, Don Knotts. <laughs> Two buttons. If you care, suck a lemon. Success. <laughs> Anonymous. Two buttons. When you are in the country and walk around the hedges, remember it was Tilly who rode around the edges. <laughs> Classmate, Tilly Cockalocker. <laughs> Funny name, isn't it, Tilly? <laughs> Two buttons. I love you in blue. I love you in red. But best of all, I love you in blue. <laughs> <laughs> Sister graduate, Tove Borgnine. <laughs> Two buttons. Wilfred Sumner, Wilfred Sumner, Wilfred Sumner. And lest you forget, I am Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> Your pal, Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> Two buttons. Remember Grant? Remember Lee? To heck with them. Remember me. <laughs> Your pal, Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> Here's one that's got a touch of genius in it. Two buttons. There is Ceylon tea, there is white rose tea, but the best tea is loyalty. Uh, uh, Your pal, Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> Two buttons. Think of Bob, think of Lee. If you need money, think of Bob. <laughs> Yours till Niagara Falls. Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> Here's one written to me by my brother. My older brother. Three months older than I am. <laughs> that was before penicillin. And he writes... Too blue which incidentally, folks, happens to be my real name. You don't think it's red buttons, do you? <laughs> my real name is Blue Zippers. <laughs> Two buttons. Roses are red, violets are blue. My father's got a horse, he's your father too. <laughs> <laughs> Memories. <laughs> Memories. Memory. Here's one. Here's one that will always live in my memory. It was written by my teacher personally to me. <laughs> Two buttons. An angel flew <laughs> from north to south with little buttons in his mouth. <laughs> And when he saw he had a fool, he took him out of public school. <laughs> Your English teacher, Wilfred Sumner. <laughs> so, goodbye to Shakespeare, old fellow Balzac. I even sent my Superman back. Believe me, there's only one book left for me. My autograph from AB. Be a celeb and by that old gang of mine. Hey. Oh, it's the obvious comment, oh. but. Everybody can identify. We've all had those little books, in the, in the, and the, everybody writes the same kinds of poems That's over right. the years. And That's everybody right. has a Wilfred Sumner in his That's life. That's right. Everybody's got a Wilfred Sumner. George, we don't want to place any undue strain upon you, but maybe a little due strain of some kind. <laughs> we took the liberty 
in the liberty taking department of introducing a guitar into the uh, into oh. your proximity. Yeah. 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 And I wasn't kidding when I said that George got started as a hillbilly singer, little Georgie Goble. Yeah, well, I uh, haven't been playing the guitar very much, and my fingers are kind of soft, but I can try it, and I didn't... Uh, yeah. Can we help you in any way? No, I, I think I can handle it. The hardest, <laughs> the hardest part is getting into this thing, you know? Yeah. But I got it now. Yeah. Like I say, I, I can't play it very good because my fingers are getting... So, I can't play it very good anyway, but... <laughs> uh, Even at your best, right? I got a brother. He can't play it at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't. I didn't, I didn't the only thing is, I feel bad about this because I haven't rehearsed with a gentleman of the ensemble. Wouldn't help. No. <laughs> no I can have a kind of a talk. Can I step out here? Certainly. Yes. Yeah. I have a little talk. Don't worry about this. I can. I, the reason I can't play very good. I, I never took any lessons. I, I just taught myself. And the reason I can't play very good is because I'm not a very good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Would you give me an E first, please? That's not, it's not exactly right. Does help? <laughs> <laughs> I just do that to show off. I want to know that I know how to <laughs> work it, you know, because I didn't know. I played the guitar. Oh, 16 or 18 years, made a good living at it, and every time I got out of tune, I just sent it back to the factory. <laughs> I didn't know that's what these faucets were for up here. <laughs> Besides, I don't play it very loud anyway. I don't play it loud enough to bother anybody. I just, here's my... It's about as loud as I play it. Because this is not an electric guitar. Well, if I may, let me get this microphone and put it in your proximity again. Why don't you put it close to me? All right. Then. <laughs> there we are. I don't know if it goes this far. Yeah, that's that'll, help, that'll help a little bit. It's a little too low. Oh, oh I don't want him to I don't think so. Down. No. no. That's not for your mouth. Oh, and then I don't want it. No, I, that's not very good. No, I don't want an electric guitar. I could, oh, no, I, I could have an electric guitar if I wanted one, but I don't want one. <laughs> I could afford an electric guitar. <laughs> I had an electric guitar once. But one one time I got to play it when my fingers were wet. I ain't never gonna do that again. <laughs> Only one. Yeah. The, then I had a gas guitar for a while. <laughs> I, I still got the gas guitar. I, I, still, I still play it sometimes. I don't play it all the time. Sometimes I play it. I tell you, when I play it, late in the summer, I work a lot of state fairs and county fairs and outdoor shows. And then, then I play my gas guitar. Outdoors. But I don't play it indoors. <laughs> Not anymore, I don't. <laughs> See, what used to happen every once in a while, every once in a while I get carried away. You know, I, I get to playing it real fast and blow out the pilot light and asphyxia it. Everybody in the <laughs> okay, here's this one. Hey, fellas, here's what you... You don't have to worry about this. I wouldn't put you on if it was tough, but uh, I'll play the guitar. I'll play the introduction, so you don't have to worry about that. And then you don't have to worry about the first four verses because I'll do them, I'll do them uh, a cappella. <laughs> Not a cappella exactly, I'll be playing guitar too. You know? It'll be sort of all gratin. <laughs> but at the end, if you could help me, if you play a chord at the end, that would be good. So just come in the chord in key of F would be good. And you'll know at the end because I'll hold my foot up. <laughs> Watch it. There was once a poor young man who left his country home and came to the city to seek employment. He promised his dear mother he would lead the simple life and always shun the fatal curse of drink. 
Upon arriving in the city, he accepted employment in a quarry. And there he fed in with several college men. But he little knew they were demons, for they wore the best of clothes. But clothes do not always make the gentleman. One night when he went out with his newfound friends to dine, they tried to persuade him to take a drink. But he refused and he refused until finally he gave in. And consented to have just one glass of beer. When he seen what he had done, he dashed the liquor to the floor. And he staggered through the door with delirium tremens. <laughs> and while in the grasp of liquor, he met a Salvation Army lassie. And cruelly he broke her tambourine. <laughs> All she said was, heaven bless you, and placed a mark upon his brow with a kick she learned before she had been saved. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> so kind friends, take my advice and shun the fatal curse of dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and don't go around breaking people's tambourines. Wonderful, George. Wonderful, George. George Goldberg. Funny stuff. Wonderful. A well-deserved ovation. You know, following something of that sort, it's not that easy for any other comedian to follow. Any comedian who's just scored well. But we have a young gentleman uh, here named Glenn Hirsch. And uh, on the basis of what I've seen of his work and his uh, fine success in TV talk shows and nightclubs and concerts around the country, he'll have no trouble. Welcome, Mr. Glenn Hirsch. Here he is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Really, it's a thrill to be on television with Steve and these gentlemen. And uh, it's not my first uh, experience on TV. And I'm also not the first one in my family to get on television. My brother was a pro bowler until he bowled a 78 on national television. <laughs> <laughs> now he lives in a cave in Canada. Uh, yeah. He made the news that night. We're very proud of him. Not many people bowl a 78 on TV. <laughs> nice to be in California. I'm not originally from Los Angeles. I, in fact, I've been traveling a lot. I live here now. I just got back from Florida yesterday. I took a super saver. I, I walked. <laughs> I wish I could have walked. I don't like to fly. And airplane food just does not agree with me. My stomach keeps saying no. And the stewardess told me yesterday, it's a balanced meal. You know, she was right. I moved the butter from here to here, and the whole tray flipped over. <laughs> I must serve more food in first class. I heard this woman tell her son, finish your food. Don't you know there are children starving in coach? <laughs> oh, God. I really don't like to fly. I made the mistake of falling asleep with my mouth open. I woke up with a mouth full of peanuts and some little kid going, what's that, 27, 26? <laughs> and it was a terrible flight. We hit turbulence. I hate the word turbulence. It's so close to ambulance. <laughs> and nobody told us the pilot was from New York. We were cutting off other planes the whole way here. <laughs> it was a maniac. Hand at the window screaming, hey, get out of the way. I'm flying here. I really don't like to fly. I always have bad experiences on the airlines. When I moved from New York to California four months ago, the airlines lost my dog. <laughs> he finally showed up. They couldn't tell me where he'd been. All I know is now he answers to the name Raul. <laughs> dog wears a beret and barks like this. Arfa, arfa. <laughs> Sit. No, I don't think so. This floor is filthy. <laughs> oh, it, it's just incredible. I tell you, I wish I could fly... I wish I could drive everywhere. I always have bad experiences. The worst experience I ever had was on a British plane, excuse me, Joe, going to London, England, that blew an engine in midair. I was terrified. 
And I'll tell you, the, the English are so different than Americans, they're so overly apologetic. You know what English babies' first words are? Oh, so sorry. <laughs> Did it hurt, Mom? Goo goo, bloody goo goo. And they're so nice. I tell you, coming from New York City, it's a terrible thing to say. I'm not used to people being nice to me. I had to learn. The English are so nice. I stayed at a hotel in London, England. I called down one night for a wake-up call. The next morning, there was a man in my room going, Glenn, <laughs> Glenn, it's time. Oh, I'll give him another five. He looks so comfy. <laughs> and they're so sophisticated. I went to the theater in London. They had ballet parking. Your car, sir? <laughs> So anyway, I'm on this plane that blows an engine in midair. Pilot didn't want to scare anybody. He came on the air and tried to find the brighter side. <clears throat> uh, hello. We're going to play a game now. Where is the burning smell coming from? Just joking. Well, we do have to level with you people. We have a fire in engine three. But don't worry, it should be put out momentarily by the Atlantic. <laughs> And there's fish for dinner. And swimming after we eat. I wish I could drive everywhere. That's the one great thing about living in California. I bought my first car, you know, because nobody walks here. The other day, my friend told me he was going for a walk, got in his car and drove away. I bought my first car. I went American. I almost bought a Volvo, a foreign car. It's a Volvo. It's a good car. You know, I like the idea if you're driving a Volvo at 60 miles an hour and you run into a brick wall, all you do is this. <laughs> well, I stayed American. I got myself a K car. Got it from Kellogg's. It's a special K car. <laughs> and I get great mileage and 10 essential vitamins and minerals. <laughs> and you know, driving outside of New York is so different for me. It's much calmer. You know, I learned how to drive in a city where brakes are an option. <laughs> where that yellow light means red light coming, go faster. <laughs> where you can get a blind cabbie who tells you not to worry because he has a feel for the road. <laughs> and there are different rules outside in America that New York can't have. You can make a right on red in this state. A right on red? In New York, we go straight on red. <laughs> what responsibility. And there's one thing we just could never have that I see every time I come to it, I'm amazed. Four-way stops on intersections. They're beautiful. You have to be so polite at a four-way stops on intersection. There's love there. <laughs> that sign should say, stop, work it out. <laughs> we should all meet in the middle and hold hands before we go on in our lives. <laughs> Folks, in New York, that would be bigger than Pac-Man. Go ahead, try it, pal. Ha-ha! <laughs> I don't have to stop till Chicago. I have noticed other people's cars ever since I got my own. And the decorations that people put on their cars, some of them I have no idea what they're for. Like these dolls that have springs for necks. <laughs> have you seen them that people put in their rear window just to make the guy behind you nuts? <laughs> Maybe I'm talking personally, but I was behind one for about a mile. It made me crazy. So I pulled up alongside. I looked over to driver and his wife a boat doing this. <laughs> Look at this, the Slinky family. How you doing? That's Hollywood for you. And bumper stickers, everywhere you look, bumper stickers. I almost got killed reading a bumper sticker once. It was written real small. I had to get real close up to read it. Before I realized that it said, I break for no reason. And how about those hands that people put on the back of their cars? That I waved that for an hour and a half once because I thought it was a little kid. Look at this, this kid won't quit. And he's not gonna beat me. I was supposed to get off five inches ago. You hear me? I found out the reason for those hands. They're waving to those dolls. And then there are some road signs I have to be aware of now. Like this deer crossing sign. Who's that one for? Them or us? You mean to tell me if there were no signs, deer wouldn't know where to cross? Forgive me, folks. I just can't imagine deer going, it's another mile. Come on, Bambi. I saw a sign in Florida last week that was even more confusing. Golf cart crossing. I didn't even know those things ran wild. With old people tied to the front bumper. And then the saddest sign in America has got to be that slow children. That tears my heart out. Look 
kind of advertisement is that for a town, huh? I feel a heck of a lot better, though. Last week, I found out those kids grow up and get work. I saw that slow men working sign. But then, thank you very much. You're terrific. You know what's fascinating? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was a little intimidated watching you guys have so much fun and then to come out and have to make them laugh at that moment. And you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. you know, sometimes people think that that casual, personal, warm way of working comes from maybe doing it for 40 years. Not necessarily. Some guys have that nice, warm quality, and you've got it. Thank you, Steve. Really Thank good. You very much. How many Can years you been? <laughs> no. How many years you been doing comedy? Uh, professionally? Yeah. About seven years now. Yeah. Really. Four spent every night at the Improv in New York. Yeah. yeah. That's great. In the old days, uh, George Burns said a few years ago, "There's no place for comedians to be lousy anymore." There is. You can be both great or lousy at these clubs and build yourself up, right? You can be lousy in a lot of places oh, still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On television, very they pay you for it now. You're splendid. And the thing that so struck me was how easy you were. That's it. Yeah. You came out, you were so cool, yeah. so easy. Yeah, I, I try to be. I tell you, Shelley, I saw you work two months ago at the Mayfair Theater and... Uh, Worried you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, unfortunately, this show is 60 minutes long. Oh. And it's a dumb line, where's the time going? I don't know, that way, I guess. Felt like about 19 minutes tonight. All of you were brilliantly funny. It's an honor to have you with us tonight. Thanks for watching. Comedy Room, Thank come back to us. Much.